Uh, thank you for the Green Building Council for your invitation for me to share with you a, a, a very uh, good topic and a very relevant topic to our department, um, talking about green buildings. Um, as a government department, um, I want to uh, trace a bit on the uh, government policy on green building. It, it has a long history, starting from uh, 1998, actually, uh, from some energy efficient registration scheme for buildings to the year 2005, we have technical circulars on uh, energy efficiency. And then policy addressed by the chief executive, um, stating very clearly that um, the government is committed to promote green building. And then uh, more recently in the year 2019, the policy address mentioned again that we have to build a livable city and a sustainable environment for Hong Kong. And uh, I'm sure everyone would agree in the year 2020 how important it is uh, for city well being, for a healthier, greener environment. And in the future, we will just be more committed and investing more resources into this area. Um, this year is the 35th anniversary of the Architectural Services Department. We commit to build our city. We built a more, uh, you know, beautiful dream, greener dream for our home here in Hong Kong. And in the past, um, like in the year 2017, RGSD has been um, awarded as the most um, beam plus final Platinum project that uh, we, we have been awarded as the organization with the most beam plus final platinum project. So, um, as you can see in the short video, we have been working on many different project types from small projects to mega projects serving many different clients. So, our dream for a greener city can be applied in many different aspects. And I've chosen a few. Uh, to share with you some of our recent work, some of our thinkings, and to look ahead. And of course, I want to learn from our second speaker, Professor Edward Ng, to see what we can do better in the future. So the first one is a promenade project. It's, uh, it's actually a composition of several minor work projects. Uh, for minor work projects in the past, is smaller scale projects under 30 million Hong Kong dollar and not, not a very large scale project, but in a series of, of small projects together, they have to do something rather interesting. And it is an urban planning and design, uh, building design project. It's one of my favorite waterfront promenade section along the harbor, which is Kun Tong. Um, okay, look at the old photos. Uh, on the top, you can see some black and white photos. This is the flyover along the waterfront. And this part of the waterfront has been used as cargo handling facilities. And under the flyover, it's deserted, not put into good use. Rubbish may appear in some of the section and some of the section are being used as a material storage area by uh, some civil engineering departments. The Naula, if you can remember, it's famous for a smell. Uh, when you fly from uh, landed in Kai Tech Airport in the past, 
um, before you land, you will smell the very special smell of Hong Kong, uh, which is not a good one. And every, you know, some older generation like me will still remember that smell. But what it is today, it has been turned into a park along the waterfront, making use of the space under the flyover, which is a very good space for passive environmental design because it's a covered space with a very good headroom. The sea breeze can uh, 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 breathe, breathe through the flyover into the inner city and a water body with a lot of um, good treatment, biochemical treatment to remove the smell. The, the water body is now good for water spots and a lot of interesting things have has happened since um, this waterfront project is uh, has started in the year 2012. And so you can see the five layering from the sea to the promenade to some building shelters and then space under the flyover and the inland. And today, as I've mentioned, the sea breeze can go through this park space, through the greenery and bring fresh air to the city. And it's no longer a cargo handling area with a lot of ways and cargoes and untidy use. It has been turned into a family uh, a place that is um, intergenerational intergener social space for everyone. The green coverage, we want to put in as much as green as possible, just a small strip as required for maintenance along the seawall and some of the, the, the hard paving along the flyover for cyclists. And most of the space are green lawn and which cover 45% of it. And even under the flyover and uh, along the road, we have a lot of greening. Uh, thanks to the operator of the facilities under the flyover, which um, the Energizing Calonese Office has developed. There are urban farming uh, with, with, with a lot of good products from it. You know, eggplants, tomatoes. I'm very happy to go back and see a lot of good things happening. And some of the green walls along the road. This green wall on the uh, left-hand side is some of the product we, uh, the, the Energizing Calonese office um, work with NAMI, which is a new material which absorb water. We retain water after each watering so that plants will grow even in a very, um, uh, 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 in, in, in a location that, that may not have a water point to water plants all the time. And so you can see all the shading, the trees and the mist that to cool the air and the use of materials that that that, that bring um, you know not not the hardness and and the heat, uh, but a very comfortable feeling when people sit on the floor and uh, to to have a nice chat with the friends. Now, water fountain. I I know that um, people in Hong Kong will know and heard about the, the stories of this water fountain and reporting in the in the media about the water fountain recently. Um, and and, and uh, some of the reporting are not, not very positive because of the political side of it, but look at the water fountain, look at the happy faces of the children. You don't see a lot of such facility, actually none of such facility has happened along the, the harbor front before. See how happy um, the, the children are enjoying this uh, water fountain, playing with water and the coolness and how it removed the heat from the floor is just amazing. And, and so please, um, despite of um, all the critical reporting about this music fountain, please encourage the uh, park managers um, the, the, our uh, leisure and cultural services department, uh, uh, give them an applause. Give them applause to be so so brave to walk out of the the, the conventional management to have the courage to management manage such a challenging facilities, and do give them a lot of commendations so that we can have more of this um, great fun happening along the world front. And uh, some of the use of materials along this park, like the oil drums, they put cartoons on it, putting it um, 
it has dual purpose. So one purpose is a musical drum, so that if you have uh, some um, uh, percussion music along the waterfront. And another use of it is as fallouts for the lorries, because there are still some lorries along this road, which may be um, causing illegal parking. And the use of some wood um, and some fallen trees uh, because of typhoon and various reasons, and they turn them into uh, benches under the flyover. And on the left hand side, you can see the old photos and what the space is like under flyover. You can still see some of the waste materials, how it is being used as uh, engineering depots. Uh, nobody can get close to waterfront. Nobody can enjoy this public space. They are just all lorries and, and, and untidiness along the whole Hoiben Road. But today, on the right-hand side, you can see the flyover being turned into stages where people can perform freely. Uh, they are turned into exhibition space, restaurants, co uh, coffee shops along the waterfront, urban farming, and a lot more possibility has been, you know, um, induced into this uh, uh, flyover by the Energizing Kalanese Office and also by the operator Elps, Aito Mangan, which is an NGO who run all these facilities. And this is the gallery, the restaurant. And uh, every time I look at it, I, I, I find it really, really amazing for such a long, stretch of land under the flyover um, with, with some imagination and a dedication to implement it and make it happen. It has been turned into an amazing urban space. See the piano, the, the little girls are playing on the piano. And this is the Energizing Kalanis office. I've been sitting in the yellow box on the second floor uh, for almost five years. And uh, I've helped to um, promote this project. And the office itself is an energy efficient building. Um, it take advantage of the space under the flyover to provide shade in its internal courtyards, natural ventilation from the sea breeze, and, um, and some daylight that was uh, collected uh, into the internal courtyards. And the materials and the steel column is recyclable. And the, the the offices are make use of uh, old containers, used containers. Okay, so much about an urban space project along the waterfront. Um, some of our new examples, columbariums. Now this is um, a column columbarium under design in Wahabsek. And the site is uh, uh, into the hillside. So the building also sits into the hill. It is a consultant project, it's done by, um, uh, uh, Dennis Lau and Ng Chan Man. And um, the design team has very nicely uh, composed the building like two butterfly wings with a central air corridor to drive wind through the building and uh, a series of uh, sun shading device, terracing, and also uh, some water body to bring coolness to, to, to the area and a large area of greening and also um, uh, photovoltaic panels on the roof. And this is the site. And this is how the form would drive the air through the building. And the area of greening is, is very high. It's uh, 1,700 meters square, which is equivalent to three tons of carbon dioxide per year. And this is the sun shading device that um, also arranged in a very interesting shape to, to fit into this natural environment and also it's shaped like a butterfly. So the, the sun shading device also uh, are inclined to give rhythm to the whole um, design. And this is a central courtyard and the greening that is filtering into the building. And um, I, I like the, the new direction of a promotion of incense free. Uh, worship. So um, only flowers are encouraged and there are uh, uh, flower um, uh, uh, re receptacles at the niches. And if the incense free culture is more popular, I think this sort of building has very, very high potential to, to, to design as a zero carbon building. 
the only high and heavy energy consumption is the incense burning, the joy, joy, joystick burning. Uh, without that, this is a very low energy building type and we can design it that way. So um, for this building, the target is 15% energy saving uh, with more than 50% um, building materials are built from uh, modular units, including the ENM services. The structural and, and, and architectural elements are 20, more than 20% of that are prefabricated and the materials are manufactured um, regionally in nearby places. So that's how the designer source the, 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 the materials. Um, school project, I like schools. I've been working with school projects since I joined RGSD many years ago. And uh, I still work with school project from time to time. I think the creativity in school project is never ending, despite that the content are more or less the same, but the, whenever you fit the school into the site, um, you can always have new ideas to create a very special community for children and students to grow up together with their teacher and friends. And schools are really important memories of, of, of when we are young and for our young people. And this school, um, uh, it has a courtyard. The central courtyard um, also helped to drive the natural ventilation through the classroom and, and into the inner side of, of the school with the open circular corridor arrangement and uh, a lot of roof greening and terracing in steps and, and how to design together with the sun angle. And that's the, 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 the breeze that would be drive through the classroom into the inner courtyard. And you can see that the classroom are arranged in a flower shape. I always call it the, the, the school with a flower, flower plan. And so um, between each petal of the flower, which is the classroom blocks, you can see um, gaps that the, the air can pass through. And that's the classroom, which is also uh, uh, designed for natural ventilation. And um, finally, uh, uh, just a few words about our future on smart asset management. Uh, with the aid of um, BIM and new technology, we have been exploring a lot of things with our maintenance team. RGSD don't just uh, design and build buildings. We also maintain our own buildings for the rest of 50 years or 100 years until they are demolished. So we, we have a very heavy responsibility for, for the building since they were born until they, they, they are demolished. And uh, so um, at the same time, it gives us a lot of um, uh, 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 resources uh, burden because if we don't maintain the building well, we don't design it well, it will have a lot of problems. And at the moment we have 8,000 buildings and half of them are over 30 years old. So you can imagine, we must explore new methods, new technology um, to help us to uh, uh, manage and uh, help us to maintain this building more efficiently. So um, with the new movement of BIM, we have much better uh, design data so that we can make use of the data for facility upkeeping and to feed the data um, into our system so that we can predict the, the preventive maintenance measure that is required. So on innovation and um, technological advancement, um, in the future, our new buildings will uh, say uh, in, in corporate census so that they know uh, when there may be a water leakage problem in toilets so that our maintenance team can attend to it. Uh, we can capture the energy information so that um, our air conditioning system should be designed automatically and adjust itself automatically to suit the occupancy uh, inside the building, uh, more greening and more you know, smarter uh, toilet management system. And on the passive design, we have also studied the sponge city concept, how the paving material matters, how we can uh, prevent flooding or collect the, the, the water from the flooding and manage it well before it is um, uh, absorbed away. And also the, the facade design, how to, 
how can we design better facade for sun shading and ventilation and all that. So um, just um, this is the end of my uh, very short presentation. And uh, we are really proud to serve Hong Kong in the past 35 years. And we will continue to build a greener city for our citizens. And um, we will serve our best to build a healthier dream for everyone. Thank you. Good. Um, yes, uh, I'm Edward. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, my title is uh, Passive Low Energy Architecture. I'm actually yeah. showing you a picture and a drawing of a house that I believe mark the turning point of our historical understanding of buildings as a climate modifier. What you see dates back to 1835. The architect was very careful on how light was introduced and how spatial volumes should be connected for air to move around and not to move around. And when I say turning point, uh, the, the house was positioned at the time when scientific and engineering revolutions were made to buildings from an environmental design point of view. This was the first house in uh, London that started to install uh, artificial gas light, central heating and uh, modern uh, sanitary provisions. In the early 80s, I uh, attended a very good dinner in London as a non-architect. I was told by the then uh, chairman of the CIBSC that uh, these were the four greatest inventions of the modern world. They are toilets, air conditioning, lift, and uh, artificial lighting. He was right. Actually, the four great inventions had allowed us to design building that kind of defy gravities and the natural environment around us. No more, we need to worry about the temperature and dim light outside. We only need to switch things on. In a way, he counted that if we were to master the art of these four great inventions, we should have no problem achieving our goal of net zero. I have been wondering. Now, these two, um, organizations have told us many things about how to design our buildings to be environmentally friendly, energy efficient and comfortable. Uh, remember the house that I showed earlier and the turning point I talked about. Uh, we can now engineer our building more and better with all those great inventions of the modern world. Let's look back at some of the pictures the picture on the right uh, is St. Barbara uh, reading a book of God uh, in a richly appointed uh, room. I'm sure there is a cold day as the fire was on. The seat was open at the back uh, facing the fi uh, fire. Uh, St. Barbara backed away from the fire so that the radiant heat warmed her back and not touched her face. She dressed up properly and more important, uh, she, she got her light from the window on her right. And she proceeded, positioned herself accordingly. Behind the window were shutters that she could close at night when it get cold. It was a picture of harmony between an individual trying to seek comfort and the architecture that provides it. On the left, since the 19th century, things has changed. One only need to pay a quarter of a cent an hour to sit on whatever Western house can provide to enjoy comfort, irrespective of what the dark surrounding architecture is about. The sad truth is, of course, that architecture has since lost its key meaning as an, uh, uh, as an environmental modifier. So it is now possible to design a low energy building by designing a very bad building first, then use very good systems uh, to save a lot of energy. I can show you more examples, anything, any shape, any material, any location, anything is possible. We can design anything irrespective of what the environment is telling us. Because we have some plants or mechanical devices to help us. Now I know a building in London called Crystal Palace. Uh, I know why the, uh, our English gentlemen need to build it after the grand tour in the tropics so that they can keep their, their plants uh, from the tropics alive. 
Until today, I still do not quite understand why we need to build a greenhouse in a tropical uh, climate. By the way, as I was told that this is a low energy building because it has very efficient, very efficient air conditioning system using biofuel. Since the 1850s, we all know what has happened. We have the four great inventions of the modern world. I still remember the oil crisis in the 1970s. It was a starting point of our energy efficiency crest. We started to realize then that we need to use less energy. But look at this chart, what has gone wrong since 1850? And more importantly, what has gone wrong since the 1970s? I'm still wondering. Now, let me go back to some fundamentals. Uh, as professors, we always go back to some fundamentals. And forgive me, I have to be so simple. Let's take the oscillating line as the outdoor environment and the horizontal line, the state of human comfort. The outdoor environment is sometimes cooler and sometimes warmer than we would like. And we therefore need some kind of effort or energy to pull the two lines together. And on the one hand is the cooling energy, of course, the, on the other hand is called the heating energy, for example. Now, this is the wonderful uh, kind of uh, diagram that I always uh, used since my student days, the relationship between human and uh, needs and the, uh, and, and the environment. In a way, when we try to design passive uh, uh, building, we start with the outdoor environment being the curve number one, and then we work on the microclimate before we move on to the building design. Only lastly, but not the least, that we rely on mechanical means to achieve comfort. And then this has always been the teaching since my school days. And since the, uh, uh, recently we know a lot about uh, human comfort, we know that the, the thin line that, uh, is not a line, but a zone. That is to say, comfort is not 25.5 degree constant. It is actually a range, and that range depends on human perceptions, the body's acclimatization, as well as the outdoor environment. So if we were to understand this diagram correctly and do all the necessary steps, the amount of energy we need to bring us comfort is the red bit uh, I've shown uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the diagram. And with a bit of help from uh, renewable energy, we should be able to achieve our net zero if we work our building this way. Now, these are the, the steps. These are the logical steps. Don't jump to steps when you try to design a building one step at a time and in that particular order and don't shift the order and don't change the order. If you don't do that, you can mess up your building designed uh, microclimatically, design a very bad building, then rely on mechanical plant to bring you all back to the uh, horizontal line. Uh, the irony is that we have been doing this uh, in the last many years, knowingly and unknowingly, since in 1850s. The unfortunate thing is that we actually uh, take it for granted and start to do crazy things. And because uh, mechanical systems can allow us to pull any line together using a lot of energy. And now they, of course, using a lot of energy, you know, in a kind of energy efficient manner. This was the slide that I showed, uh, I think a group of stakeholders uh, all the way back in 2011. Uh, I told uh, the audience that uh, actually at that time, most, if not, if not all, uh, building and environmental assessment systems in the world celebrates the slide I showed you just now. That building, good devices. And um, if you if your building don't have those devices, you can't even score. Okay, so and, and you get silver uh, if you do not have those kind of devices. This is another slide that I show. I say, oh, uh, go back one slide. Ah, this is a slide I also show in 2011. It was about good passive low energy architecture in Hong Kong that one should focus on. And I've been told that this uh, understanding has been incorporated into the Beam Plus 1.2. And since then, if you design a very good uh, passive uh, low energy building, you can get some score. 
And I'm very happy that uh, the, the later version, the 2.0, has been updated, but the fundamentals are still there. And these are some of the fundamentals. And some of you would like to consult the, all the uh, text to see how you can design better. But more importantly, I think uh, uh, is this particular diagram that's showing you on the one hand, the uh, comfort zone as depleted by the blue and the green circle and the green and uh, 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 red line, uh, dots that uh, deplete the outdoor environment. Therefore, I think when we try to design our building, we should always try to see how we can design for people and start with people first. And here come my key, some of my key advices. Number one is if your user does not want to work with you on the environment, it does not matter what you do. They will always find an energy intensive way to live in your energy efficient building without exception. Now, look at the, uh, the example in Japan of cool beast and the super cool beast. When they started the, uh, the, the framework, they start with people and, and start with how they dress, about the idea, about the working style, about how people work in the building and not the, the system that occupy the building. So I always believe that if you somehow design a building that people can enjoy when they try to live an energy efficient lifestyle, that would be good. Let people move around so that they can somehow find comfort themselves. Welcome people with an environment before they come into your building. Let people relax outside your building to continue their work comfortably when they get tired. Shade the sun always before it gives you all its heat, all its heat. Okay, this is very important for the tropics. Shade the sun, shade the sun, shade the sun. And let people feel the air movement. Oh, air movement itself is not very good. People need to find a way to feel it. Let people feel the day of the time and also, as well as the movement, movement of, the, of the daylight. Don't forget humans' biological needs to have contact with the outside. It is extremely important. And provide spatial environmental diversity that people can choose how to behave. But do not encourage energy efficient laziness. And very important is use your building to communicate to the user an environmental agenda. Very important, don't design to save energy. Design so that people like your building so much that they will live to save energy. And that is most important. If you don't do that, you have to watch out for this uh, Givon's paradox. Fundamentally, it says if people don't buy it, energy efficiency due to technical, technological advances can only lead to further resources demand and an increase of resources use. That has been proven uh, economically. And that is what we nowadays know as rebound effect. If you don't want it, people will find a way to bypass it. I can talk a lot more. And uh, if you want to hear more, you have to come in to become a student at the CUHK. And I can tell you everything that I do not know. Now, I would like at this juncture, uh, before I end my lecture, to uh, introduce you two books. Now, uh, my teacher, uh, Professor Dean Hawkes, always told me to design a good living environment for people technically is not that difficult. However, it will take you a lifetime of learning to design a good living environment for people poetically. So let people feel, let people touch, taste, smell, hear, and see the environment. More they like it, more they will respect and treasure and try to protect it. Don't do it the other way around. Don't try to massage the building. Try to work with people. Now, a bit of sales talk uh, um, before I end. The International Association of uh, Passive Low Energy Architecture, short name PIA, uh, was established in uh, 1982. Uh, we have been trying to give architecture back its long lost 
uh, environmental meaning. So uh, we welcome you to visit it, join its meetings and read the papers. And by the way, the, uh, the picture is uh, Dean Hawke's house in Cambridge. He always told me, I designed my low energy house so that I can enjoy living in it. And uh, this idiot is uh, the current uh, president of PIA and you are always welcome to buy him lunch and ask him questions. Thank you. <laughs>